Good news from the graveyard. He's not dead. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Matthew chapter number 16, verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist. Amen. See, first thing they thought the Lord was a Baptist preacher. Ain't that something? <laughs> right? Some, alas... Others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. I like what old Doc Ruckman said about that. They mistook the Lord for being one of the most rudest, crudest men of Israel. Right? He took the roughest prophets that they had out there, and they, that's who they described him as. They didn't describe him as an effeminate, delicate, little frail man that walked around with a limp wrist. You understand? They recognized him as a real man. You understand? Amen. Kind of like Jim Mc, or, uh, Mark McGahey. Oh, <laughs> well, that'll probably go over real good. Amen? Mm -hmm. hey, <laughs> I'm talking about a man. A man that look you right in the eyes and tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, no problem telling people the truth. Look them right in the eyes. You understand? He was a plain preacher. He told a plain. He told it straight. I mean, how many people you sit down to dinner with and he look at you, thou hypocrite? Right? How long do you want to sit around and eat a guy, with a guy that's, huh, that's calling you a hypocrite? <laughs> right? Knows all your problems, all your faults. Listen, he is a rough character. Amen. Verse 15, he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Isn't that a blessing? And he said, and Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. I say unto you, or I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter. And upon this rock, that's his confession, the Christ, the Son of the living God, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against what? It, the rock, not the church. You understand? Amen. Father, we love you. We ask you to bless now the preaching of the word tonight thank you for everybody that's here i just ask you to bless your word speak to them encourage them god squeeze their heart tonight in jesus name amen uh oh, thursday's thanksgiving amen amen mm -hmm. and uh if you've never heard rush limbaugh's interpretation of thanksgiving you need to hear it i'm not going to ruin it for you just look it up on the internet, see if you can hear it, see if it's on YouTube somewhere. Uh, he wrote about it. He describes the very first Thanksgiving. Fantastic. It, it's a history lesson you're not going to get in the public school. Amen. And I, I agree with what he said. I, I, don't, I don't see no reason to refute him. I'm not going to spoil it for you. Uh, just it's worth, it's worth listening to. He usually plays it every year. Right? Well, I quit listening to all them guys a couple years ago. I haven't, I haven't listened to... Sports radio, I haven't listened to political radio. I just shut it off. I'm listening to the Bible and things like that. I'm not listening to the world out there. I got accused of putting too much of the world in my preaching, and I said, you're right, I do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to eliminate that. I'm going to just saturate myself with preaching and the Word of God and just let the book come out of me. Amen? And still, some of that stuff still sips, seeps out of me every now and then. Amen? Right? Amen. Uh, I'm thankful. Are you? Mm -hmm. What are you thankful for? A lot of 
Amen. I'm thankful. You know what that word means? You know, it means your full thanks. I'm thankful for having. Da, 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 da. I'm thankful for having some things. Amen. First thing, you say, what are you thankful for? I'm thankful for having a living God. Amen. You say, what's the big deal about that? Well, if you had a statue to kiss all the time and tote around. <laughs> Amen. A living God to give thanks to. I serve a real living God. Amen. Amen. I'm glad I got a God. I'm glad. Listen, there's a woman years ago. She's Japanese, and and uh, she wound up going to church. I'm bo I'm ruining the the illustration, but she wound up going to church and heard that the living God became a Lord and Savior for her. And uh, she went home, and the preacher came by, or the husband came by, one of them, and they seen these little gods out in the yard, and they wanted to know what them little gods were doing in the yard. She said, "Well, I used to serve them and pray to them every day, said, but now I found out that Jesus is the true and living God, so I worship Him and I threw them gods out." How <laughs> I many you think about it? I, I mean, if you, you you ain't really lived till you've been to some place like Mexico or the Philippines, and go into those those houses and they got shrines set up with these big idols and statues, and and they got the idol of Mary or Saint Christopher or somebody up there. They got a monk and they got all these candles lit and they got this big old shrine where they go in and they kneel down in their living room. Their whole living room is dedicated to that man, and they go in there and they worship, and they worship in a statue. They're worshiping an idol. Steve Brogdon came back from Papua New Guinea. And when he came back from Papua New Guinea, he had this little basin and had this round, perfectly round rock. Completely round. And beside it, he set a baseball, and it was about the exact same size. And what those New Guineans do is they worship that rock. And they worship that rock. And, I, and he put that baseball beside there, and they kind of, hmm, yeah, somebody, Americans worship something round. Right, they worship a ball. Right? Didn't Gideon's dad say, Will you plead for ball? I mean bail. Right? <laughs> right? Amen. Amen. And listen to me. You know what they do? They sacrifice a pig. Yeah. And you know what they do? They cut its throat and they drain the blood out. Huh. How about that? And you know what they do with that blood? They sacrifice it to that God. And they'll take that blood and they'll pour it on that rock and that rock, that little round rock, soaks up all that blood and drinks that blood off her. And they sacrifice to that thing. You know what Americans do? They sacrifice to their little ball. Pool ball, basketball, baseball, football, ping pong ball, tether ball, soccer ball, foosball, right? Right? Bowling ball, right? Right? Amen, amen, tether ball, right? Super ball. Bouncy, bouncy, bouncy ball. <laughs> Dodge ball, right? I mean, listen, America worships ball. Right? Cue ball, black ball, eight ball. Hey, Amen. are you behind the eight ball tonight? <laughs> Hello, they worship it. Hey, Amen. Listen, the world worships a ball. But I'm just trying to tell you, I thank God that I serve a true and living God. Let's turn to John. John chapter number 6. Jesus is a plain preacher. He tells it like it is. He doesn't pull no punches. Amen. I thank God for a man of God that will tell me the truth, tell me what I need to hear, not what I want to hear. Amen. If I ever get to the place, I'll tell you what you want to hear versus what you need to hear. Fire me. Amen. John chapter number 6. They're, they're talking with Jesus. Verse 60. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear? And when Jesus knew himself, the disciples murmured at it. He said on them, Doth this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is a spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words I speak are their spirit and their life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given him my Father. From that time, many of his disciples, what? Went back. Walked no more with Jesus or more with him. What do you think about people quitting God? Preacher, you offended them. They come to Jesus. Jesus, you offended them. 
And you look at that, you got a bunch of people, they don't quit church. <clears throat> Amen. So a preacher ain't worth the salt if he don't get some people offended sometime and send them along their way with their tail tucked between their legs. Hello? Amen. Listen, a real man of God will tell you the truth. Jesus did it. So what kind of preacher are you? I'm just like the Lord. Amen. I'm one of his men. He said, but he did it in love. You did it. Hey, spite, meanness. <laughs> okay. Verse 67, Jesus said unto the twelve, will you also go away? He looked at everybody that was left. He goes, hey, will you also go away? You going to quit? Just when the heat gets turned up in the kitchen a little bit, you going to run and chase them? See, people want to go to a church where they can fit in, blend in the crowd to where they can't get flushed out. They don't want somebody to tell it like it is because, see, they want to pretend. See, a lot of churches today pretend to be something. Doesn't the Bible say that? They come unto you as unto my people come. And they speak with the mouth, but their heart's far from me. Amen. Jesus knew their hearts. Jesus knew what he's saying. Verse 68. Here's a very smart answer. Then Simon Peter answers it, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Exactly. There you go. You follow the book. Right? You follow the word. You got the words of eternal life. Who should we go? There ain't nobody else got the answer. Lord, you got the answer. Exactly. There you go. That's how you follow the right man. How? He's got the book. He's got the words of God. He's telling you what the book says. Listen, I am doing the best I can to keep my opinions out of this thing. Uh -huh. Amen. I'm trying to get to where I'm an unopinionated person. I got a lot of them. Amen. I mean, I'm trying not to share them with you. <laughs> because usually when I share my opinion, it all just goes downhill from there. It really doesn't matter what I say, does it? I was thinking about a verse a while ago. I was writing it down. One of the first verses I memorized was 1 Thessalonians 2.4. I can't remember it for life of me now. He says over there, he says, uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, 4. Uh, he said, uh, man, well, I just messed it up. Thank God. He talks about being put in trust of the gospel. He was always speaking, not pleasing men, but God which tried their hearts. Yep. You understand? God put me in trust of the gospel. Verse 5 good too. And I'm not to, listen, God tries my heart. I'm not to please men, but God which tries my heart. God put me in trust of the gospel. God entrusted me with the gospel. You know what I'm supposed to do? I'm supposed to please God, not men. Men didn't entrust me with the gospel. God entrusted me with the gospel. So you know what? I'm not to please the deacon board. I'm not to please the richest men of the churches so they can keep paying my salary. I'm supposed to be pleasing the one that entrusted me with the gospel. He gave me the gospel. He said, here, son, I'm putting this into your trust. I'm committing it to your trust. You faithfully preach that thing and please me, not men. Right? Amen. Listen, that's a big thing. So you know what i got to do? i got to make sure that I please God and not men because man didn't call me. God did. You say, well, you know, if you keep preaching the way you preach, you ain't ever going to have a big church. I'm not worried about having a big church. That ain't my plan. That ain't my goal. You know what my goal is? He's entrusted me with the gospel to be faithful to preach his words in his book. Amen. 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 So that's what it's all about. Thou hast the words of eternal life. Verse 69, I like this. And we believe and are what? Sure. sure. Amen. That thou art the Christ, the Son of who? Amen. The living God. You know what I got? I'm glad I got a living God I can trust in. First, that's first uh, Timothy chapter number 4. 1 Timothy chapter number 4. I'm thankful I got a living God. Amen. I'm thankful. Amen. I got somebody I, that's greater than all. Amen. That's alive and well. He's my creator and I'm so glad I can go straight to him. I don't have to worry about President-elect Trump. Huh? I don't have to worry about home Obama. Amen. Amen. I'm glad that uh, I don't have to worry about Hillary. Amen. 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 I'm glad. Now listen, I, it don't matter who's in the, white, the rainbow house. Right? <laughs> Hello? Amen. I'm, I'm glad I got, I got a true and living God who knows what's going on. And maybe he's testing all the preachers out just to see how many of them are falling on their face and pray and plead 
and sigh and cry, right? Didn't Ezekiel 14 talk about that? All the men sighed and cried for the abominations of Israel. I wonder how many preachers are sighing and crying over that. Well, brother, you're next. Tee up. Right? God, I mean, they're out there having fun, enjoying it. Are they weeping and crying? Are they pleading and preaching? Something to think about. First Timothy chapter 4. This is a good one. This one gets everybody worked up. Verse 7. But refuse profane and, and old wives' fables. Aren't you glad he added fables there? Instead of refuse old wives? <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for fables, huh? <laughs> Amen. And exercise thyself. <laughs> exercise thyself rather on godliness. <laughs> Amen. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. Amen. Having the promise of what? Life that now is and of that which is to come. Amen? I have life now. Not just life to come, but I got it right now. Do you have life? Do you live? Do you enjoy life? Well, look at what it says. Right? Verse 9. And this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation. For therefore, we both labor and suffer reproach. Why? Because we trust in who? The living God, who is a Savior of all men, especially those that believe. Listen, I got a Savior. He's a living God, and I trust in Him. You understand? I'm glad I ain't got to tote my God in the church. Amen. All right, come on, bring him in. Hey, have you, you seen? Have you seen that black preacher that's got that statue of Mary in his church? Dwayne played that thing. You got to look on YouTube. This black preacher, he's got he's got the statue of Mary right there, and he's talking about her, and he's got a hammer in his hand. And he goes, "Hey, Mary." <laughs> <laughs> hits her in the head, breaks her head open. Right? And he breaks that statue right there in front of everybody. He's trying to show everybody the statue ain't nothing. Mary ain't nothing. Amen. Amen. I thank God he had enough guts to do that. Amen. Hello? They probably won't pick on him because he's a brother of color. Amen. <laughs> oh, amen. Right? But if it had been a white preacher, oh my, he'd be in trouble. Right? Hello? Amen. <laughs> Amen. It's like old Jerry Brown said, what color was he? Purple. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Jerry Brown looked at me and said, boy, look at me. I said, yes, sir. He said, I'm black. He looked at me, I'm black. I'm black. He called me black. I'm not purple. I'm not colored. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. He said, preacher, you're in trouble tonight. Hey, you know, he just let her rip, pay the chip. Amen. We all needed to know. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! First Timothy chapter number six. Six. First Timothy chapter number six. <laughs> Amen. I love it. This is a good church, right? Amen. First Timothy chapter number six, verse thir seventeen. Charge them that are what rich. Amen. In this world. You know who the rich people are in this world, don't you? Americans. Well, but Bible. Lawyers. No. In James chapter number 2, it tells you who a rich man is. He has goodly apparel and he has a gold ring on his finger. Right? I'm telling you, the Bible describes what rich people are. That describes almost all Americans. Yeah. Right? Amen. Charge them to the rich in this world that they be not high minded nor trust in what? Uncertain riches, but in who? I mean, who are you trusting in tonight? Huh? You trusting in the living God? Look at what he says. Who giveth us richly what? All things to what? Enjoy, amen. Are you enjoying your life? First Timothy chapter number three. First Timothy chapter number three. That's why us Americans are backslidden and we're the layout of seeing church because we're enjoying all things, amen. Yeah. Right? Amen. Verse 15. But if I tarry long, amen. That sounds like a good verse for a preacher, right? <laughs> huh? But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou ought to behave thyself in the house of God. Please don't lean out the window and fall out like Eutychus did. <laughs> amen. Which is the church of who? The living. the living God. Amen. The pillar and ground of truth. I sure thank God for the, for, uh, the living God. Hebrews chapter number 3. 
Hebrews chapter number 3. This is a rough one. You guys ought to have this memorized as much as I preached on unbelief. Amen. Hebrews chapter number 3, verse 12. Take heed. What's take heed mean? Pay attention. Notice, right? Call your attention to. Right? Take heed. Brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of what? Unbelief. In departing from who? Living God. You know why people backslide? You know why people quit church, quit reading their Bible? Because they quit trusting in the living God. Their hearts departed from the living God. You know why people are sitting home watching television at night instead of sitting in church and hearing preaching? Because their preacher's a bummer, man. I'd rather watch TV than listen to that nut preach, right? Hello? Amen. No. You know why they're sitting out? Because they depart from the living God. Why do they depart from the living God? Unbelief. You know why there's a guy sitting at a bar stool tonight He used to go to church? Because he doesn't believe what God says about drinking. Huh? You know why some guy tonight left his family and went to Hawaii with somebody else's wife? Because he doesn't believe God. He departs from God. Why? Because he doesn't believe him in his heart. From who? The living God. You know why teenagers get out and leave church when they grow up? Because they got educated. They went to college and found out that God doesn't exist. Hello? Anybody can talk you out of the book, amen? You didn't have salvation to begin with. Hello? Hey Amen. How can you how can somebody talk you out of meeting somebody that you met? Right? Hey Amen. I met Jesus Christ. He met me. He came into my heart. He's changed my life. He made me a new creature. I can't deny that I know him. Hello? Hey Amen. If I did, I'd be lying, wouldn't I? The reason why people depart is because of unbelief. And what's the Bible say about unbelief? What's it say? And Evil heart. Oh, we're good people. We love we love everybody. We're nice. It really the Bible says you got an evil heart of unbelief. Right? You know what Sam Gipp says? He said, How many people in here have a wicked heart? He said, No, I don't have a wicked heart. You have a desperately wicked heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10. <laughs> hey man, I better get off that before I get shot, right? Hebrews chapter uh, 9. Hebrews chapter number 9. Listen, I noticed, I, I noticed that in the book of Hebrews, there's a lot about the living God. God's talking to the Jews and they wound up turning to idolatry and worshiping idols. The doctrine of vanity, the doctrine of stocks. Right? When they left Egypt, they come out and said, Aaron, make us a God. Now comes this golden calf. Right? And they begin to worship the golden calf. And then Jeroboam, wound up making Israel sin a sin. He made two golden calves. And they worshipped it. They didn't learn from the first golden calf, so they had to worship another golden calf. And you know what? Israel's heart kept being turned. and kept being turned. and kept being turned to worship an idol. And God kept dealing with them. So the book of Hebrews deals a lot with the, the living God. The living God. The living God. Verse 14. 9, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ you through the eternal spirit offer himself without spot to who? God. Purge your what? Conscience from dead works to serve who? A statue? Huh? Can you imagine always having to put your God in His place and then bow down and worship Him and tote Him around and kiss Him and then dust Him off every day? Huh? Can you imagine that St. Peter's over there, St. Peter's Basilica, that they don't kiss that statue so much they wore the big toe off his foot? And then they had to regrow his toe. Ain't that crazy? Hello? I'm just trying to tell you. I'm glad I serve a living God. I don't have to go to a piece of rock. I don't have to go to a statue. You know how I wind up getting saved? Because there's a woman named Janet. Can't remember her maiden name, but her name was Risco. And you know what happened? Janet wound up not kissing the statue of Mary. And a nun liked to beat her to death. And I thank God Grandma would not kiss that statue because that got her saved one day. She realized that she needed to trust in a true and living God, not into a piece of stone or granite. You understand? And Grandma wound up getting saved. And Grandma told me about Jesus and told me what the nuns did to her when she was in school for refusing to kiss a statue. You know what that did? That helped me. You know what that helped me to do? The trust in the true and living God. Well, I thank God. I thank God for I got a living God. Yeah. Amen. And you don't have a busy signal, Brother Rob. Seven billion people in this world, and I can call them up. I ain't busy. 
right, I can walk right in. And man, he's there. He's prompt. He walks with me. He talks with me. You know what his name is? It's Andy. And he walks with me. And he talks with me. Okay, never mind. You'll get that one. <laughs> no, it's Jesus. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Hebrews 10 31. Amen. Verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of who? The living God. The living God. Chapter 12. Chapter 12. Amen. God's trying to get through Israel that He's a living God, He's not an idol. Verse uh, 22, to the general of assembly, the firstborn, which are written in heaven, to the God and the judge of all men, right? Uh, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. I'm in the wrong place. 12, 22. 22, I'm sorry. But ye are come unto the Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Listen, a living God. You know what he did? I'm glad I got a living God. I thank God for him tonight. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I, th I thank God for the living God. Number two, I thank God for the giving God. Amen. Amen. To appreciate. Do you appreciate him? Let me ask you a question. I'm, I'm not going to pick on you. Okay. <laughs> Hello. How big's your Christmas list this year? Hello. A giving God to appreciate. Let me ask you, when you take your prayer list to God, how much on is on it about getting something from him? God's not a vending machine. But most people, the only time they go to God in prayer is, God, I need a new car. I need a new house. I need a new ring. I need a necklace. I need earrings. I need, right, I need a boat. I need a motor home. I need a jet ski. Hey, you understand what I'm saying? I need, I need a four-car garage to put all my toys in. You understand what I'm saying? Most people, when they go to God, their prayer is all about getting something out of His hand. Right? Mm -hmm. But I thank God i got a giving God to appreciate. Let me ask you a question. Before you think you ought to ask Him for something, don't you think you ought to appreciate what He's already done? Yeah. I challenge you to spend time. Just, t just take time and say, God, I'm going to try something that's almost near impossible. And He said, what was that, my dear child? I want to spend time just thanking you for everything and not asking you for anything. And I just want to start thanking you for everything that I could possibly think of. And you just start thanking them. Lord, thank you for my toothbrush and the toothpaste and the water to rinse my mouth out. Lord, thank you for the Q-tips to clean out all the potatoes in my ears. And God, I thank you for Kleenex. And God, I thank you for toilet paper. And I thank you for a toilet. And I thank you for indoor plumbing. And God, I thank you for an indoor shower and warm water and a water heater. And you begin to start thanking God for everything that comes across that you use every day of your life. God, I thank you for all the people that had to die to help make my car better. Yeah. That I'm protected in case I ever get in an accident. And I thank you for the men that are on call tonight, Lord, sitting there anxiously waiting that a possibility of an accident might happen. And God, I thank you at Miami Valley Hospital's got a care flight up there in case one of my family, one of my members wind up getting hit. And there's a surgeon on call ready to bandage me up, put me here. And God, when I get to that hospital, I thank you, Lord, for all those instruments and all those bags and all. Listen, when my wife had them surgeries and I went into them operating rooms and I watched them open up all these things, somebody had to take time to package all that medicine and get all that stuff and all them rags and all them scalpels and all them clips and clamps and all that stuff. And they brought in a staff and they spent hours, thousands of hours to prepare themselves for that surgery. And you think about all the stuff. What they got to do to make that city run. And then you think about, I mean, do you ever think about Robin City? Do you ever thank God for them? You say, or Christy? Do you ever thank God for Robin, Christy? I keep calling her Cindy, don't I? I'm sorry. That's your new name. Amen. You didn't know. Amen. We got two Cindy's in the church. <laughs> and, and Robin Christy. Do you ever think about that? When you go to Kroger's and you walk in 
There's bread, and you just yank, yank bread off. You know what? They got to stock it. They get up at 2 o'clock in the morning, go down there, amen, get a load, and go out, and they stock the stores. You think about all the people stocking the shelves, so when you walk into the store, amen, you can get what you want off the shelves. Isn't that an amazing thing? You think about all the work everybody's got to do and all the services that men afford to us. I mean, when you start praying, you begin to start thanking God, man. I mean, God, thank you for the bread. Thank you for the wrapper. And thank you for those that cooked it and put all the ingredients together. And God, thank you for the butter on my bread. And God, if I never get butter and I never get honey and I never get jelly and I never get peanut butter, God, thank you for a stale piece of bread. And you begin to start thanking God for the refrigerator and the ice cubes and the water and, and the glasses to hold it all and the pots and pans and the microwave. Whoo, man. Right? We got a 30 plus year old microwave right there and we bought a brand new one. Man, that thing heats up five times faster than that dude did. <laughs> but you know what? I thank God for trash bags and somebody had to make them. Somebody had to design them. Somebody had to pack them. Somebody had to send them. I thank God for the chairs. I thank God for everything. You understand? What I'm, I mean, you could, you could begin to start going and start thinking. Right? Right? All the things we can start thanking God about. I mean, a clock. Sometimes it's your worst enemy. Mm -hmm. But boy, how important a clock is in our life. Yeah. Amen. I mean, you begin to think about it. Think about somebody that took time to design a bottle and put water in it so you can have something to drink. <laughs> somebody wound up getting oil out of the ground and turned it into gasoline so they, they conveniently put it at a gas station so you can walk over, slide a card, stick something in there, and then you could travel and go. When was the last time you thanked God for the gasoline you put in your car? Huh? I mean, bow your head and say, God, I thank you for the gas I get to put in my car. Thank you, God, for that. Thank you for the water hose to wash my car. God, thank you, Lord, for the ice scraper to scrape my windows in my car. Thank you for the defroster that somebody put in the window so it could thaw that. Thank you for the blower that blows the heat. Lord, thank you for the radiator. Thank you for the antifreeze, God. Thank you. Listen, I mean, you could be going on and on and on. Thank you, Lord, my car breaks down. There's parts in the store. <laughs> all right? Somebody had the foresight to think ahead. Thank God for all them that think ahead. How, what a blessing that is for us. Right? Amen? But you know how many people wind up getting hurt, losing limbs and losing life and losing eyeballs and all kinds of things where they can perfect our life? How many people were damaged to help us? Think about that. Think about the guy sitting there ready to embalm you. Huh? You don't think about that? I mean, Dax, can you imagine Dax cutting you open and reaching down? Huh? <laughs> I thank God. Aren't you glad you're there? Aren't you glad you're there? Yeah. Somebody there to bury you, put you in the ground? Yeah, amen. Hey, you think, you think about the doctors and some of the things they got to do. Some of the places they got to... I'm telling you, it's unpleasant. But somebody took their time to study to help you. Right? To help you deliver you from cancer and things like that. Well, I tell you, you know, who wants to do some unpleasant things? Some people got to do some unpleasant things. You know what, God? I thank you. Somebody's willing to do the, the, the unpleasant things of life to be able to help me. God gives us those things. What a blessing. Thank God for the guy that invented the vacuum cleaner. Yeah. Amen. You know who that was? It was God. He gave me a wife. Amen. No, I'm sorry. I'm just teasing you. <laughs> Thank God for the couch, the man that designed the couch. <laughs> amen. The dog house tonight, yeah, amen. For God so loved, he what? He gave. Huh? Amen. Listen, I'm glad he gave. Uh, number three. Some things to be thankful for. You know what I'm thankful for? I'm thankful for saving God. Amen. I got a saving God to enjoy and rejoice in. You thank God for saving you? When's the last time you really got it? beside yourself about being saved from the flames of hell. I'm talking about a burning hell. A 
the hell that you deserve to go in and weep and wail and gnash your teeth for all eternity. That God in His marvelous grace, because you're a violator of His law, deserve to plunge you in the flames of fire for all eternity. Bind you hand and foot where you'd scream and weep and wail for billions upon billions upon billions and trillions upon trillions and quintillions and quintillions. Amen. Of, of years. Forever. And if. And if. And if. And he plucked you out of the flames of hell and made you his own child and saved you. Did you ever see yourself lost and undone, willing to go right there, the jaws of hell ready to consume you, and God pulls you out just about the time the jaws of hell clamped down on you? You know what he did? He plucked me out of the burning hell. He saved me. That's why I like that song that the Fitches sang. Amen? About uh, he rescued me. I was going down for the last time, and you know what? It seemed like a hand from nowhere reached down and grabbed me, pulled me out. Boy, I'm so thankful. Listen, I didn't swim ashore. <laughs> My boat went down, and I'm floating in the sea of sin, and I'm ready to go down, right? Everything that I trusted in is gone. The Titanic's gone. And out of nowhere, I cried out. And somebody lifted me up like Peter. Walking on the water and begin to sink. Lord, save me! And the next thing you know, he's standing on the water. Walk back to the boat with Jesus. I thank God for saving God. You know what I do? I rejoice. I love it. When, when uh, righteous men glory, amen, rejoice. The Bible says there's great glory. Proverbs 28.12. 28, Listen, I thank God for that, man. We ought to be shouting. We ought to swing from the chandeliers, amen. Hello, I'm, I'm thankful for that. Amen. When's the last time you really rejoiced in being saved? When's the last time you was in prayer and you was just worshiping at His feet? And you said, God, I just thank You for the blood that saved my soul, that washed me water and snow, that I don't have to go to hell. Bless Your name. When's the last time you got beside yourself? I challenge you. I challenge you to go out. Go to the cemetery up here. Go up there where all them graves are at so you can wake somebody up. Huh? I challenge you. Just to get out there and just let her fly for about 60 seconds. I mean, just just everything you got, just magnify the Lord and bless Him for saving you. See what happens. <laughs> you might get a holy grunt out of a cow. <laughs> right? The Bible says in John 3.16 what? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through Him might be saved. Amen? Listen, are you saved? Let's look at 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. Oh, this is good. 2 Timothy chapter number 1. Oh, man, you want some good preaching? We could preach on this passage and never get out of it forever. Verse 8. Well, verse 7 is good. Amen. Verse 6 is good. Verse 7. God hath not given us the spirit of what? Fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. You know there's a lot of people who got a problem with their mind. They want to run to the doctor and get medicine. God gave us power of a sound mind. You don't have a sound mind tonight. It's because you're not resting in what God gave you. God gave me a sound mind. Amen. You say, what's that mean? He gave me a level head. Hello. Amen. Verse 8, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. There we go. Separate the men from the boys. According to the what? The power of God. Who hath saved us? Isn't that a blessing? And called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to what? His own purpose and grace, which is given us where? In Christ Jesus, when? Before the world began. Lord, in Christ Jesus, God had a purpose for you. Amen. Are you fulfilling that purpose? He's got a plan for your life. Why were you created? For His pleasure. Is it for your pleasure? Or for His pleasure? Let me ask you a question. You ever gone to him in prayer in your prayer closet and said, God, you created me for a purpose. you got a plan for me. And you created for me to please you. God, are you pleased with me? you pleased with what I think? you pleased with my Bible reading? Are you pleased with my praying? Are you pleased with my giving? Are you pleased with my witnessing? Are you pleased with my praising? 
God, are you displeased? According to 1 Corinthians 10, it says over there, with whom God, many of them, God was displeased. God, are you displeased with me? Is there anything in my life you're displeased with? God, the best way I know how, and I'm not trying to be proud, I, I, I tell you, I'll change everything in my life. If you'll give me the power that's displeasing to you, that I might please you. Lord, I thank you for everything you've done for me. And Lord, you've given me life. And now I want to return this life back to you. And I want to worship you. And Lord, I want to please you with everything that I got. Every ounce of my fiber, every ounce of my being. As long as I got breath, I want to please you, Lord. Lord, I thank you. You're good. You saved me. Lord, I don't want you to be displeased with me. Look at what he says in verse 10. But now, or but is now manifested by the appearing of his son, Jesus Christ, who's what? Abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light how? Through the gospel. Well, I'm telling you, God's got a plan for our lives. Amen. Titus chapter number three. Titus chapter number three. I'm just talking about being thankful. I'm glad I got a God, a living God that I can give thanks to. I'm glad I got a giving God that I can appreciate. I got I got a saving God I can rejoice in. Titus chapter number three, verse four. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He what? <clears throat> saved us. By the washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Ghost. Notice it didn't say baptism. Thank you, Lord. Which He shed on us abundantly. How? Through Jesus Christ our Savior. That being justified by His grace. grace. Didn't say you were justified by water, did it? You're justified by grace. You know what? I got, I'm glad. Amen. That I got a God that saved me. You know what else I'm thankful for? I'm thankful tonight I got a loving God. <laughs> now, you got a loving God? Amen. Someone who genuinely, gen, you, n, n, e o i, double n, e o i, genuinely cares. You know what the Bible said in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7? Well, you guys ought to know these verses. 1 Peter chapter number 5, verse 7. Casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. You ever cast all your care upon Him? Or do you keep it for yourself and carry it for yourself? Woe's me. Woe's me. Woe's me. No, listen, it ain't ought to be that way. It ought to be we're casting our care upon Him. What are we doing being full of care? What's he saying in Philippians 4, 6? Be careful for nothing. Don't be full of care about anything. Now, if you want a new Bible, you know, it says anxious, but I'm not anxious about anything. But I do get full of care. And sometimes I care a lot about my circumstances, my situation. And I care about how people feel and how people think. And then Don Green said the greatest day in your life is when you get a divorce from public opinion. Huh? You cast your care upon them. Who cares what people think? Lord, it doesn't matter what they think. Lord, what matters is what you think. Whew, that's a tough one. <laughs> hey, man. It's tough. You know what? I'm glad I got somebody that loves me. That genuinely loves me. Look at 1 John 4. We read this a lot the other night. 1 John chapter number 4. You Pentecostals major on the love of God, but they never focus on the wrath of God, right? God, God does hate things. Amen? Listen, if you got a God that's all love, and he, He's not a balanced God that don't hate some things, you got a pervert for a God. Amen? John 4, verse 7. 1 John 4, 7, Beloved, let us what? Love one another, for love is of God. It didn't say love is God, did it? For love is of God. Amen? And everyone that loveth is what? Born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested His love toward us, because God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him here in His love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. He's the payment for our sins. He stepped aside in His will to pay the price for us that we might live. That we might have life. And that we could love. You know what God wants? He wants love. He created you to love Him. Not for you to 
Mm-hmm. Right? Huh? I see those men, they're weightlifters, and they, you know, you know, they put mirrors in front of them. One of those heavy, heavy, uh, big old WWE guys, Lex Luger, came out, and he's posing, and he puts out a mirror in the ring, and then he starts kissing himself in front of the mirror. Hello? That's what people do. They worship themselves. God didn't create me to worship me. Right? Mirror, mirror on the wall, ain't I the loveliest of them all? Right? We do love the person in the mirror. Shiny no, we spent so much time in front of them. You want to know what I know about a mirror? You, you, know, you want to know a good name to call a mirror? Liar. It lying to you. <laughs> right? I'm telling you, I go out there in the world and I see people walking around and I said, somebody told them they actually look good when they left the house. <laughs> Somebody lied to him, right? To go stand over there. What do you think, honey? Oh, yeah, it looks good, baby. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he just said that so he can go home. Hello? Hey, Amen. When are you going to be honest? My wife knows. She goes, what do you think? If I don't answer, answer if I go, hmm, she just takes it back to the store, right? She knows if I don't, I mean, if I, as a man, I like that. Hey, Amen. Hello? Man, I lost you on all that one. I'm sorry. I really apologize. <laughs> Amen. And cut down on your time in the mirror now. <laughs> Amen. Cut it back from four hours <laughs> to at least three, right? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> all right, number five. I'm getting, getting closer to being done. I'll be done. I'm long in preaching like Paul. I'll be done. Amen. Isaiah 9, 6. Amen. I, I'm glad I serve a mighty God. Right? A mighty God. To glory in His power. Unto us a child is given, unto us a son's born, something like that. Is that what it says? To, to us a child is born on us a son is given amen his name should be called wonderful counselor the mighty, mighty God right the everlasting father right no he is he's a mighty God amen. Jeremiah 32 you want to write down Jeremiah 32 beside that Jeremiah 32 you say why because the Jehovah Witnesses and all them don't want to ever call him a mighty God they want to say, well, he's not the Almighty. Well, we're not done with our Bible study yet. Jeremiah 2, 32, verse 6, 17. Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, thou hast made what? The heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm. There is nothing too hard for thee. Thou shalt show loving kindness to thousands, recompense iniquity of fathers into the bosom of the children after them. The great, comma, the mighty God, comma, the Lord of hosts is His name. The mighty God is the Lord of hosts. Jesus Christ is the Lord of hosts. Amen. You understand me? That's His deity. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter number 1. Verse 8. Revelation 1, 8. I am Alpha and who? Omega. Omega, the beginning and the ending. Saith who? The Lord. Which is and which was and which is to come who? The Almighty. Verse 11 saying, I am Alpha and Omega, first and last. You see that? Verse 17, And when I saw him, I felt his feet dead, and he sat. He laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am who? The first, and first and the last. I am he that liveth, comma, and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and had the keys of hell and of death. You know what? The Almighty one time died. When did the Almighty die and then come back to life and is alive forevermore? If Jesus Christ is not God Almighty, you got a counterfeit. You understand? i got a mighty God. i got the Almighty God as my Lord and my Savior. You know what Brother Lou Guadano said? And I love it. He said, quit trying to work out your own miracles. Let God do a miracle for you. 
You've got to do something miraculous in your life. Trust Him for something. Listen to me. I, I got a message years ago. What can you trust God for? What are you trusting God for? It's real easy for us to be self-sufficient and do it our own selves and try to work it out and try to get people saved and do all kinds of things. Listen, what are we trusting God for? Don't try to work out your own miracles. Say, God, I'm going to put you to test. I'm going to prove you. I'll give you an example. I'm not trying to stick a feather in my hat, but I'm going to give you an example. Jack Wood said, a preacher ain't worth a salt, can't pray in a hundred bucks. I said, God, I ain't worth my salt, I ain't praying in a hundred bucks. I said, God, I'm going to pray in a hundred bucks. God, I need a hundred bucks. Lord, I need a pair of boots. And I, I need a pair of boots and mine are falling apart and I need a hundred bucks. And I, I and at work, they just kept giving me a hard time. So when are you going to get, get new boots? You can see through them. You ought to put windows in your boots. I mean, they're falling apart. And I kept wearing them every day. And I said, God, I need a hundred bucks. I need a pair of boots. I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm going to, I, I want to pray in a hundred bucks. Jack Wood said, I ain't worth my salt. God, I ain't worth my salt. I can't pray in a hundred bucks. God, I need a hundred bucks. God, would you send me a hundred bucks? And that went month after month after month. And I began to, I was begging God. I said, God, Jack Wood said, I ain't worth my salt. Obviously, I ain't worth my salt. I can't get in touch with you. I can't pray in a hundred bucks. One day a check came in the mail. The check came in. Guess how much the check was for? Huh? You guys are wrong. Guess what how much it was for? It was one hundred and eleven dollars. You know what I did? I had a hundred bucks for the shoes and I had eleven bucks for the tithe. Huh? He said, son, when you prayed for it, you didn't pray enough for tithe. And he sent me a $111 check. Hello? Isn't that good of him? So I guess I'm worth my salt now. <laughs> prayed in 100 bucks and the tithe. Hello? I'm just trying to tell you something. You ever put God to the test? What you say in Malachi chapter number Well, he's talking to the Old Testament Jews about the storehouse. He says, prove me. Yeah, there you go. Herewith. Hmm. Prove me. You ever prove God? Say, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to do something for you and for your glory, and I'm going to prove you. You know what God wants? God wants you to check him out. Yeah. Try him. See if he won't do what he says. Mm. Put him to the test. You know how many people won't tithe and won't give because of that? They look at the 90, they pay all their bills, and say, I ain't got nothing left over. Instead of starting at the front, and then say, God, you work out the rest. You know what a bunch of men did at the church? I got saved at Calvary Bible Baptist Church. A bunch of men got together. You know how they got that church built and they got it going? The guy that was the pastor of that church, Brother Branson at that time, his dad used to be the pastor. And his dad was the pastor of the church and they wanted to build a church. And he came to all the men of the church. He said, fellas, I believe God wants us to build a church. And he said, I'm going to put a challenge out to you. He said, let's take our weekly paycheck and every one of us sacrifice it, put it into the offering plate, and we all sacrifice a week's salary for the glory of God to build this church. Not one of them did without a meal. None of them had their power cut off. None of them lost their bill. All their bills were paid. And the church got started and built. That's pretty good. When all the men are willing to say, hey, we're with the preacher. Here's our weekly paycheck. That's something to think about, ain't it? You know what they did? They proved God. They put God to the test. You know what God looks for? It looks for faith. Amen. I'm glad I got a mighty God that I can trust. He said, preacher, you're always talking about money. You know what I used to do? I used to go with a man down here to Green County Jail. I said, Brother brother Mac, what are you here for? He said, i got two boys that's in prison. He said, I'm coming up here witnessing to somebody else's boys that maybe they'll go witness to my boys in prison where they're at in a different state. You know what he did? He stepped out by faith to go minister to somebody else. Maybe I'll go witness somebody else's son to the Lord, and God, you'll take care of my son. You know what that is? That's faith. You know what that is? Putting faith in an almighty God. Amen. Hello? <laughs> You know, one day God told me to take off my coat and give it to a street bum that had newspapers for shoes. Took them home, bathed them. Man, that bathroom stunk so bad after I gave him a bath. Washed his clothes, had the wash machine and everything stinking so bad. A friend of mine, Richard, wound up buying him shoes and we fed him and I tried to clean him up. His hair was so matted. I mean, it was unbelievable. Guy stunk. I mean, stunk. Oh, man. And uh, took him to church that night with me, gave him a New Testament. And... Uh, I let him off. He wanted to let me off. Let him off at an Orange Grove, and the Lord said, "Take off your sport coat, and give it to him." I said, "Lord, it's the best one I got." He said, "Take it off, and give it to him." I said, "Lord, but you don't understand." He said, "It's cold tonight. He needs a coat." And I took off my best sport coat, and I said, "Here, you need something." He put it on. And I watched him walk off into the Orange Grove into the darkness. 
You say, what happened? I've never needed a suit coat since. I've had so many suit coats given to me, I've had to get my way. You say, what? God tested me. God proved me. The Almighty God said, trust me with your suit, son. You know what? I trusted him. You know what I did? I proved him. You know what God's done? God's provided over and over and over and over. I mean, listen, I've given the rent away for the church. I I asked God for a thousand bucks, and God gave me a thousand bucks, and I sent the rent money down to support prayer week. Guess what happened? God sent in a thousand bucks to replace it. You say, you got to be kidding me. (laughs) I'm just trying to tell you what God does. You know what we do? We prove God. You ever put God to the test? He's a mighty God. Amen. I better get off all that. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter number 40. He said, Preacher, if you don't shut up, I'll be late for work. Amen. You can go anytime. Amen. Isaiah chapter 40. You won't hurt my feelings. I've had all kinds of people walk out on me. So, Isaiah chapter 40. Verse 28. Hast thou not known? Isn't that a good question? Huh? Four words. Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard? That the who? The everlasting God. Amen. You know what my God is? He's everlasting. Can I give you something about my God? He's not the ever ready battery that runs out. Right? He's everlasting. He lives forever. Amen. I got somebody to love for all eternity. Somebody to love for for all eternity. Amen. This ain't just a earthly thing. It's an eternal thing. Amen. Somebody's gonna love me forever and I'm gonna love them forever. I got an everlasting God. How long's your God around for? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creators of the end of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary, there is no searching. He giveth power to who? The faint, to them that have no mighty increase of strength. Boy, what a God. Even to you shall faint, be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, and they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You know what he's going to do? He's going to give me power. He's going to give me strength. Who? The everlasting God. Romans chapter number 16. Romans chapter number 16. I, I thank God I got an everlasting God. Everlasting. I got somebody that's eternal that I can live with and live for. Man, it's not just for here and now. What's 1 Corinthians 15, 19 say? I ain't got no idea, preacher. That's good. I'm glad you don't have an idea. He said, if we have hope only in this life, we are of all men what? Most miserable. Most miserable. If I only have hope in this life... Yep. I'm of most men, all men, most miserable. Amen. It's the most miserable thing just to only be happy in this life. Right. You know what he's promised me? Everlasting joy. Mm-hmm. Everlasting righteousness. Everlasting love. Boy, oh boy. Romans chapter number 16, verse 24, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, period, amen. Ends the book of Romans. Okay? Now, if you've got a little pencil, you can write beside there, P.S. Now to him that is the power to establish you according to what? You want to be established in the faith as a Christian? You better get in Paul's gospel. Not the gospel of Christ, the, that Christ preached, but the gospel of Christ. You understand? According to my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to revelation of the mystery, which is kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest how? By the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting who? God may know in all nations for everlasting faith to the only wise God be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Listen, I thank God I got an everlasting God that taught me the truth and He can establish me now and forever. Amen. What a God. One last thing and I'll be done. Psalm 7. Psalm 7. Been a real positive message, ain't it? I'm going to give you the bummer now. But if you understand the Bible, you'll understand and see that this is the beginning. Verse 10, Psalm 710. My defense is of 
God, which saveth the upright in heart. God judges who? The righteous. God is angry with who? The wicked every day. You know what God is? I thank God for God being the judge. The judge. God, the judge. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. I'm glad that there's a judge that I can fear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil, right? Amen. I thank God. The beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord. The Bible says, Be in the fear of the Lord all the day long. Look at what he says. Verse 11, God judges the righteous and God is angry with who? The wicked every day. You ever hear anybody say that? Oh, all these men prancing around the Victoria's Secrets in their fishnet laced pantyhose out on the streets. And they say, oh, God loves them and God loves all of us. Really? Okay. Look at Psalm 5. Psalm 5, verse 5. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou what? Hatest all who? Workers iniquity. Listen, God hates workers iniquity. God hates sin. God hates wickedness. You understand? Six things does the Lord hate. Yea, seven is an abomination. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, arrogancy, the forward mouth, and evil way do I hate. God hates all that stuff. Listen, God's going to judge you. You're going to have to give an account of every, every idle word. How about that one? That's a good one, ain't it? Huh? You said, what's, what do you mean by an idle word? Well, when you should be working, you're standing around talking. You're idle. You're not busy. You're complaining about the boss. Complaining about the other co-workers. And God's just, oh yeah, idle word. See, they're, bu they're not busy. They're talking. They're stealing from the employer right now. And he's writing it all. You've got to give an account of all that. Uh-oh. You know, the Bible does tell you in Ecclesiastes 10, I think it's verse 20, you know, to be careful not to curse the king in your bedchamber. You said, why? Bird of the air. Bird of the air will carry the matter. Did you ever hear anybody say, a little bird told me? They got that out of the Bible. Yeah. Huh? Let me tell you something. Can I, can I help you? When you get to the judgment, I can't prove this, but I believe with all my heart, people sin in house. And uh, somebody said, well, nobody saw me. The Lord says, hey, Mr. Goldfish, come here. And then comes walking this goldfish. And he talks to it, and the goldfish says, yeah, Lord, they, they were fornicating in the living room when nobody was home. Yep, yep, uh-huh. So okay, thank you. I appreciate that witness. A goldfish, yeah. A bird of the air. A cat, a dog, a squirrel. Well, I'll tell you what. There's nobody in the room but a couple cats. Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. Then it comes a cat to judgment. What do they say? Well, Lord, this is what they said. Brother, little, 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 little. And they tell the Lord. God's got witnesses. Mm. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 12 that God's going to bring every secret thing into judgment. Hmm. He knows your thoughts. He knows them far off. You know what? I know i got to face God one day for my thoughts. So you know what I try to do? I say, wait, hold it, stop. That's not permitted in my brain. Please get out of here. You said you do that? The Bible said in 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, bring every thought into captivity. Lord, I plead the blood. I bring that into captivity. God, that's not a pleasant thought. That's not a good thought. Lord, that's a bad thought. Lord, please get it out of my head. I bring it in the name of Jesus Christ under subjection. Lord, I want to control my thoughts, my thinking. I don't want to think bad things about people. I don't want to think a bad thing. I don't want to think fleshy thoughts. I don't want to think worldly thoughts. You know what Job said? Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes. Job 31.1. Isn't that something? He made a covenant with his eyes. Yeah. That I should not think upon a maid. Isn't that amazing? He says, my eye, lamentation says, affects my heart. So Job made a covenant with his eyes. He said, eyeballs, I make a covenant with you. If you see something, I won't think about it, okay? All right, you got a deal, Job. All right. You know what that is? That's fear of God. You say, preacher, somebody done dropped you on your head one too many times. Amen, you're right. Amen. My dad smacked me quite a bit. In fact, if, if you were to, and I'm not being ugly, but if you were to pull my britches down and see, I got a tattoo on my backside here. It says true temper. That's where my dad used to beat me with a shovel. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> right? I, got a, I, got, I talk about giving people red wing tattoos. He said, what's that, amen? <laughs> my dad used to use mason shoes, amen? I got tattoos all over my backside. Hello? Amen, amen, amen. 
Boy, well, that ain't flying very good. <laughs> Amen. Romans chapter number 2. Romans chapter number 2. I'm just trying to help you tonight. Listen, you've got to give an account to God about your thoughts. Do you fear Him? I tell you what, if you had a good, healthy dose of fear of God to keep you out of sin, keep you from talking wrong, doing wrong, going wrong. There was a, there was a couple Christian couples who wanted to go to a casino out in Las Vegas. They lived out there. And they said, let's go to a casino. Yeah, let's go. And they all mounted up and they drove up to the casino. When they pulled up to the casino, some of the letters were blacked out on the word casino. And there's only three letters lit up and it said sin. And those Christians go, God don't want us in there tonight. Let's go. We was wrong for even trying. Hello? Ain't that funny how three letters burn out while the other three stayed lit up? He said, Preacher, God burnt them other letters out so those Christians that wanted to do right, He prevented them from sinning by blacking out those other letters so they could just see sin. Isn't that amazing? What do they call Las Vegas? Sin City. Sin City. Why does a Christian want to go there? To sin. <laughs> right? Romans chapter 2, verse 15. He will show their work of their law written in their hearts and their conscience also bearing witness in their thoughts meanwhile accusing or excusing what? Yeah. One another. You know, you know what you do? You find somebody that, that's in the same sin as you're in. And they'll talk each other into it and then they'll go off into the sin. Why? Same heart, same mind. Right? You take a bad boy from Louisiana and a bad boy from Ohio take them to a youth camp in Missouri and they'll find each other before, before the week's out they'll be pounding out running around you take a good girl from Ohio you take a good girl from California and they meet in Missouri at a youth camp and they get yoked up together and the one wants to hit the altar the other one to be at the altar and the next thing you know they're praying together and you got good friends you see how does that work amen because when you're released to yourself you'll go to who what you are look at verse 16 in the day when God shall judge what? the secrets of men how? By Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that an amazing thing? Boy, I tell you, God's a good God. I thank God for God knowing my thoughts. I thank God for preventing me from sinning. I'm not a Calvinist, but I want to do right. Amen. Hello? Amen? God will keep you from getting in those situations. Now, I'm not saying the devil, he won't allow the devil to come by and tempt you. But there's a way out. Joseph didn't have to go inside that house, did he? But he got out. He left his coat, saved his character. But uh, he knew she was in there. She was bidding for him every day. But yet he kept getting close to it. He kept playing with fire. He almost got burnt. He got put in jail for 20 years for it. He did right, but he went to jail for 20 years for it. How's that? Lord, I did right and I had to go to jail. He wound up saving his brother's lives. Saving his family's lives. Listen, you may do right and go to jail. You may do right and get killed. You may do right and get crippled. You know, as Brother Sandlin said to John and Tina Green, they're getting married. He said, John, would you still love Tina, even if she's in a wheelchair paralyzed all her life? He said, I sure would, Brother Sandlin. They were driving a bed truck. Three weeks later, they got in an accident. She was tired. She was laying down there. He rear-ended somebody, and when she got rear-ended, she slid forward. She hit the, hit the dash and broke her neck. She's paralyzed. Boy, that puts you to the test. Will you love her, even though she's paralyzed? And he got mad. He got angry. He got bitter. That wheelchair kept scuffing his shoes. John's a very complete, polished man. He's immaculate. But yet, them shoes kept getting scuffed by that wheelchair, and he got mad at that wheelchair, and he's getting bitter at that wheelchair, and he's getting mad at God for that wheelchair. He loved his wife, but he was bitter at that wheelchair. And then one night, he went downstairs, got woke up, and he went downstairs, that wheelchair was there. And the sun was, or the moon was shining in through the window on that wheelchair. He went over to that wheelchair, and he began to repent. He said, God, I'm sorry for being so angry at that wheelchair. And he began to kiss that wheelchair. He said, I love you, wheelchair. You've been such a blessing to me, wheelchair. I appreciate you, wheelchair. And I thank you, Lord, for allowing me to be able to take care of my wife and love her. And thank you, Lord, for the wheelchair that you gave my wife that I can enjoy. i got a dear friend. His name Jason Kendrick, and that's his aunt. And his aunt Tina has been paralyzed all them years, and they're serving God, living for God. But you know what? You've got to be willing to trust any judgments that God has that comes in your life, good or bad. 
When Lydia died, I went home and I knelt down at the, in my chair and I said, Lord, I love you. And I won't quit serving you. I'll serve you. Amen. I had no idea. A few weeks later, my sister-in-law would get saved. If you'd known the change that took place in Sandy's life, you'd appreciate the judgments. And my wife will sit back and she'll tell us, she said, I'd do it again to see Sandy get saved. And you know what? My brother-in-law got saved. My sister-in-law got saved. My mother-in-law got saved. My, brother, my father-in-law all got saved. Maybe sometimes you might have to telegraph a loved one home. Amen. You know what? God's judgments are true and righteous all together. God makes no mistakes, but you know what God does? Sometimes you'll bring that in just to keep the fear of God in your life. So you fear Him. Amen. Amen. Father, we do love you. Suppose at night when you close your eyes You take your final breath All the years you spent here on earth Not a minute would you have left Did you ever ask the Lord to save you Ever get down on your knees and pray Do you know what you're gonna hear when you face him on judgment day Will he say enter in my good and faithful one Or will he say depart from me I never knew you and the wicked things you've done Will you Final time, do you know where you will 